This is Let's Get Growing with horticulturalist Nathan Wilson at Lanier Nursery and Gardens in Flowery Branch. Get information you need for gardening, landscaping, and home plant care. We're taking your calls right now at 706-865-3181 or email info at wrwh.com. Now, here's Nathan. Well, good morning and welcome to a special edition, a Halloween edition of Let's Get Growing. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's uh, cut out all the silly Transylvanian accents. But today I would like to welcome you to a special edition of Let's Get Growing, where today we're going to focus a little bit on plants that, um, let's just say, aren't too nice. Plants that are deadly, perhaps. Plants that are creepy, plants that are unusual, perhaps even dangerous. You know, we walk into the garden and we see all the beautiful things, but sometimes we forget that uh, plants can be dangerous. So today, you know, you think about plants like roses, which have thorns. They have a beautiful side, but they also have an ugly side. And I'm going to introduce you to some plants and stories that you may or may not have heard. If you're just beginning to listen to Let's Get Growing, I want to in, uh, invite you to listen to old shows on YouTube.com. Just feel free to uh, go to YouTube and search Let's Get Growing or WRWH, and you'll find old shows uh, there on the site. Oh, and be sure to go to Facebook and like WRWH because it is your favorite station, so you need to like it. That's for sure. Uh, if you want to listen to some programs uh, from WRWH while you're away and maybe not near the radio, you can do so on your smartphone app. Just go to the TuneIn app and you search WRWH, and there you will find all of the great programming, uh, live streaming. You can listen anytime, any place, anywhere, as long as there's an internet connection. So today, like I mentioned, we're having this special Halloween edition where I have uh, recorded some stories. I have researched and searched the world over for unusual plants, plants that uh, might be a little scary or dangerous. I think it's going to be exciting. I think you're going to love it. One of my first uh, scary stories that I ever heard was actually dealt with uh, actually dealt with the garden. My grandmother would tell us the story of I want my big toe, in which a little old lady goes and purchases some seed potatoes. She plants them uh, at night. Uh, excuse me, she plants them in the garden, but she didn't realize that there was a giant's toe in that bag of seed potatoes. And she plants the potato, the potatoes and the, um, and the toe without knowing it. And of course, later on that night, she is awoken to this deep voice that says, I want my big toe. And the voice gets louder and louder until finally my grandmother would scream, I want my big toe. And uh, the monster was right there at her bedroom window. So it's scary stories this time of year, of course, are fun. Don't worry. Nothing's going to be too frightening here. Maybe I've just exaggerated the scariness of these things. But I think you're going to enjoy it. We've got a lot of things lined up. you got to definitely hang around for the last segment of the show uh, where I give my top 13 deadliest plants. Why 13? Because... 13 is the deadliest number. Isn't that right? So anyways, uh, I would say that if you are listening today, you will be in for a treat. Perhaps a little bit of trickery, but mainly a nice little treat. Who knew that the garden could be so dangerous? Whenever you take that little tiptoe through the tulips, be sure that you are wearing a thick rubber or leather boot and are treading lightly because some of these plants we're going to talk about today are definitely not just dangerous, but they are deadly. So I hope that you'll find that interesting. Let's start off with a, a little story. At this time of year, you'll probably get with your kids or your grandkids or some neighbors down the street, and you're going to whip out a knife, and you're going to begin to just rip apart a fruit that comes from our gardens. Of course, I'm talking about jack-o'-lanterns. But where does that story begin? What is the history of the jack-o'-lantern, and why did a what is essentially a gourd become so popular? Let's listen to this story, and I think that you'll really learn a thing or two about not just the history, but also a little bit about our favorite fall-time fruit, the pumpkin. The legend of the jack-o'-lantern comes to us from somewhere in Ireland, and 
Ironically, this tale begins with a man and a turnip, not a pumpkin. Stingy Jack, as the townsfolk called him, was a real cheapskate. Just as his name suggests, Jack was really greedy, but he was also very clever. As the story goes, Jack was a miserable old drunk who loved to play tricks. He would play tricks on practically anyone. His friends, his enemies, his own mother, and one day, even the devil himself, and on more than one occasion. One time, Jack tricked the devil into climbing an apple tree. Immediately, Jack began to place crosses around the trunk of the tree, and the devil, who couldn't touch a cross, was trapped up high in the tree's canopy. Jack then made a deal with the devil, like many throughout history have. Jack agreed to let the devil out of the tree if he would promise not to take his soul when Jack died. The devil agreed. Yet another time, Jack was being pursued by a mob of angry townspeople from whom he had stolen some goods. Upon passing by the devil, Jack convinced Satan to bedevil the church-going villagers who were in hot pursuit by turning himself into a coin so that he could pay for the goods that he had stolen. Jack told the devil that he could disappear as a coin later on, leaving the villagers to fight amongst themselves who had taken the coin. The devil agreed to Jack's plan. The devil commenced to turn himself into a silver coin and jumped into Jack's coin purse, only to find himself squeezed tight to a cross that Jack had picked up in the village. Being strapped next to a cross, the devil was stripped of his powers. Jack allowed the devil to go free as long as he swore, again, to not take his soul when he dies. Despite Jack's cleverness, however, the devil had the last laugh because, you see, upon dying, God wouldn't allow his entrance into heaven because he had been mean and cruel, a drunk who had led a miserable, worthless life. And Satan wouldn't let him into hell either because of the promise he had made to Jack of not claiming his soul. So Jack was forced to aimlessly wander the earth alone. Jack asked the devil if he could have a light to help guide his path, and the devil obliged, mockingly throwing him a small piece of a burning coal from the embers of hell. Jack then carved a face out of a turnip, not a pumpkin, placed the burning coal inside, and used it as a lantern. And, as the legend goes, he's been wandering ever since. The first jack-o'-lantern was not made from a pumpkin because the pumpkin is not native to Europe. Old Stingy Jack and the Irish people wouldn't have even known of its existence hundreds of years ago. They wouldn't have known about pumpkin because it's a fruit that's native to, well, right here, the Americas. All pumpkins are considered winter squash and fall into a group of plants known as the cucurbits. This makes the pumpkin a close relative of not just crooked neck squash, but also cucumbers and gourds. The oldest evidence of pumpkin-related seeds date to between 7,000 and 5,000 BC. These seeds were found in Mexico. Botanically speaking, the pumpkin itself is a fruit, a type of berry called a pipo, to be more precise. Just like other cucurbits, the pumpkin plant produces both an independent male and female flower. The female flower must be pollinated by pollen from the male by some type of pollinator. Usually, the honeybee takes care of this. However, with the decline of bees, many gardeners are forced to hand pollinate their pumpkin plants themselves. Because of their need for pollination, it's very common amongst gardeners who save their seed to find cucurbit fruits with unusual characteristics year after year, an effect directly caused by cross-pollination. Pumpkins are now grown all around the world. However, the only continent that is unable to produce pumpkins is Antarctica, with its all-too-cold temperatures. The United States, Canada, and Mexico are the top producers of agricultural pumpkins, and the traditional American pumpkin used to make jack-o'-lanterns is a variety known as the Connecticut Field Pumpkin. A couple of years ago, a Belgian man was awarded with growing the largest pumpkin ever. His little peepo was weighed in at a whopping 2,624 pounds. Try checking that out at the grocery store counter. In 2013, the city of Keene, New Hampshire, broke the record for the most jack-o'-lanterns lit simultaneously. 
The total jack-o'-lanterns lit on October 19, 2013 was 30,581. When waves of Irish immigrants flooded to the Americas in the mid-1800s after the devastation caused by the potato famine, they brought their story of the jack-o'-lantern and Stingy Jack with them. But they began to favor this American gourd, the pumpkin, over a turnip. You see, pumpkins are much easier to carve with their semi-hollow bodies and soft flesh. There is a lighter side to this story, however. Throughout the 19th century, jack-o'-lanterns were also known to be used for nighttime pranks. Kids growing up in the Victorian age would carve out creepy faces into pumpkins, place a candle inside the cavity, and use them to scare unsuspecting people at night. The Massachusetts poet John Greenleaf Whittier described the time period well in his appropriately named poem, The Pumpkin. O oh, fruit loved of boyhood, the old days recalling, when wood grapes were purpling and brown nuts were falling, when wild, ugly faces we carved in its skin, glaring out through the dark with a candle within. Whether a jack-o'-lantern makes you cry or laugh this Halloween season, perhaps it will remind you of a poor, cursed soul who has endlessly been wandering this earth for centuries with nothing more than a hollowed-out turnip in his hand. Oh, and be sure to light a jack-o'-lantern for poor old stingy Jack so his wandering isn't quite so dark. Well, wasn't that quite scary, huh? <laughs> oh, anyhow, not too scary. But the pumpkin is an interesting fruit. A lot of people think of it maybe as a vegetable. But remember that a fruit is anything, is the product of a flower. So a tomato is a fruit because it originally comes from a flower. You have to have a flower first, then the flower is pollinated, and the flower uh, has an ovary which swells and becomes a nice fleshy, or in the case of you know nuts, um, kind of a dry fruit. Uh, however, fruits come in all shapes, sizes, and forms, but uh, this particular orange fruit, eh, sometimes they're white and sometimes they're other colors, but these pumpkins aren't really that easy to grow. In our area. And the reason is because they do succumb to a lot of diseases, uh, whether it's bacterial or fungal, particularly fungal diseases, as you know, because you live here, as do I. <laughs> uh, Georgia in the summertime can be quite uh, humid. So we have high heat and also high humidity. And those two things are not too conducive for the pumpkin. Most pumpkin production, uh, even though it's mainly in the United States, is up in New England where uh, the pumpkin has found its niche. It just grows very well. You don't have to treat it any special way, as you would here, with perhaps um, something to control the diseases. And so you can grow them in your landscape. You can grow them in your garden. But just keep that in mind that you will probably see a disease called downy mildew, powdery mildew, maybe some bacterial blotches, uh, spots and whatnot. But regardless, you can grow them and you can, by the end of the season, you could have your very own jack-o'-lantern that you grew in your own garden. So keep that in mind. I think that uh, when we think about the pumpkin, maybe we think about turning it into pie. It's not one of my favorite uh, dishes. But uh, I would prefer like a sweet potato pie along that same lines, which, of course, sweet potato is not a fruit. It is a true root of the sweet potato plant. And so anyhow, there's a lot of uses for pumpkins. But like I mentioned, in our gardens, they're a little tough, but definitely give them a try maybe next year. And the whole thing about the cross pollination that we uh, heard in the story is that flowers from cucumbers, flowers from uh, squashes can cross pollinate with pumpkins or gourds or whatever. And you can result with this odd shaped uh, plant next year if you save your seeds. A lot of people say, what is this? This looks like a squash, but it has these little warts on it. And I say, well, it's a warty squash. <laughs> Perhaps something uh, cross-pollinated with your squash last year. You save the seed, and there you go. You've got it. Again, folks, today is our special Halloween edition of Let's Get Growing, where I'm trying to intermingle some spooky stories of deadly plants and whatnot, along with, of course, gardening tips for your landscape and your vegetable gardens. And we're going to have to go to break, but be sure that you hang around, because by the end of the show, I am going to present to you my 13 deadliest 
deadliest plants. And along the way, before we get to that, we've got plenty more spooky stories of the garden. So hang on tight and we'll be right back with more delicious stories. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in Saturday mornings at 9 here at 93.9 FM WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. In her book um, called Wicked Plants, Amy Stewart, who is a garden writer, writes about uh, plants that are a bit sinister and basically has inspired a lot of the uh, information here and the stories uh, in today's Halloween special. So be sure to check that out. It's called Wicked Plants by Amy Stewart. And I thought that uh, some of her stories are just... uh, very creepy, very, um, very scary, especially some that lead to uh, deadly effects. Some plants have been used not just for homicide, but also suicide. And so perhaps we'll talk a little bit about those plants and, of course, the benefits they may have uh, if used appropriately. Um, And, of course, we always, as usual, want to make sure we steer clear and uh, are careful with these plants. So enjoy these next two stories uh, that come from Amy Stewart's book called Wicked Plants. In A.D. 77... Pliny the Elder described the oleander as an evergreen, bearing a strong resemblance to the rose tree, and throwing out numerous branches from the stem. To beasts of burden, goats and sheep, it is poisonous, but for man it is an antidote against the venom of serpents. Pliny may have been the most influential botanist of his time, but he was wrong about the oleander. The only relief it would provide, a snakebite victim, would be a swift, and merciful death. This highly toxic shrub is popular in warm climates around the world for its red, pink, yellow, or white blossoms. Because it is so widespread, it has been implicated in a surprising number of murders and accidental deaths over the years. One popular legend is that campers have died after grilling meat over the campfire on skewers made from oleander twigs. This tale is unconfirmed, but the poisons in the sap and bark of oleander could easily contaminate food. Oleander contains oleandrin, a cardiac glycoside that brings on nausea and vomiting, severe weakness, irregular pulse, and a decreased heart rate that leads quickly to death. It is also toxic to animals. In spite of the leaves' bitter taste, a cat or dog might be tempted to nibble them. Inhaling the smoke from burning oleander wood can be highly irritating, and even honey made from the plant's nectar can be poisonous. A study of compost made from oleander showed that oleandrin remains in the compost at detectable levels for 300 days, but that vegetables grown in the compost don't absorb the toxins. Children are particularly at risk because it takes only a few leaves to kill them. In the year 2000, two toddlers in Southern California were found dead in their cribs after chewing on the leaves. Just a few months later, a woman in Southern California tried to collect on her husband's life insurance by putting the leaves in his food. He went to the hospital with severe gastrointestinal problems, but he survived. And as he was recuperating, his wife finished the job by offering him Gatorade laced with antifreeze. She is now one of 15 women on California's death row and the only one who attempted murder with a plant. Unfortunately, oleander has had a reputation as a medicinal plant, leading people suffering from certain kinds of cancer or heart problems to attempt an oleander soup or tea from recipes they find online. This practice is very dangerous. Although there have been attempts to market an extract called anverzel, In the United States, it has not received approval in the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Other common plants that are related to oleander include plumeria and periwinkle. In 1240, Bartholomus Anglicus described the yew plant in his Encyclopedia on the Properties of Things as a tree with venom and poison. It's fitting, perhaps, that this highly toxic tree has come to be known as the graveyard tree in England. 
The plant earned that name not for its ability to send people to an early grave, but because Roman invaders began offering church services in the shade of yew trees, hoping that this would appeal to the pagan population. Today, ancient yew trees are still found near churches in the English countryside. The sight of these yew trees in cemeteries inspired Alfred Lord Tennyson to write, Thy fibers knit the dreamless head, thy roots are wrapped about the bones. In fact, an ancient churchside yew growing in the English village of Selborne was toppled during a storm in 1990, and the bones of the long-ago dead were found tangled in its roots. The yew is a slow-growing evergreen that can live two or three centuries, but it is difficult to date mature trees because the dense wood doesn't always produce rings. The fine needle-like leaves and red fruit make it an attractive landscape tree that can easily reach 70 feet in height. In England, yews are often pruned to form a formal hedge. The Hampton Court Palace's legendary 300-year-old hedge maze is now planted almost entirely with yew. But every part of the yew is poisonous with the exception of the flesh of its red berry-like fruit, called an arrel, and even that contains a toxic seed. The arrel itself is slightly sweet, making it a temptation for children. Eating just a few seeds or a handful of leaves will bring on gastrointestinal symptoms, a dangerous drop in the pulse rate, and possible heart failure. One medical manual mournfully noted that many victims never described their symptoms because they were found dead. Yews pose a particular hazard to pets and livestock. A veterinary medicine article stated that often the first evidence of yew toxicosis is unexpected death. In Caesar's Gaelic Wars, suicide by yew became a way to avoid facing defeat. Catavolcus king of a tribe who lived in what is now Belgium, was worn out by age, unable to endure the fatigue, either of war or flight, and destroyed himself with the juice of the yew tree. Pliny the Elder wrote that travelers' vessels made of yew wood and filled with wine could poison people who drank from them. But before ripping that yew tree out of your garden, consider this. In the early 1960s, a team of researchers from the National Cancer Institute discovered that yew extract had potent anti-tumor properties. Now the drug paclitaxel, or Taxol, is used to fight ovarian, breast, and lung cancers and shows promise for many others. Companies like Limehurst Limited collect hedge clippings from English gardens for the pharmaceutical industry. Research indicates that yew trees even secrete the drug into the soil, opening up the possibility that cancer-fighting compounds can be extracted without harming the trees. Relatives of the English yew include the Japanese yew, which is native to Japan but grows throughout North America, also Pacific or Western yew, which is found in Western United States, and, of course, the Canadian yew, which is often called Eastern Hemlock. Well, well, who would have known that probably that beautiful hemlock outside your window is related to a family of plants that is known to be quite deadly. Very good stories, I think, today for this Halloween special for Let's Get Growing. I hope you're enjoying them. I hope that uh, I'm not scaring you too much. That's not the intention. The intention is to, of course, be in season here uh, since we're getting close to Halloween and also give you some information about plants that, even though, like I've continued to say, they look nice and pretty, sometimes beneath their bark, you will find some dangerous chemicals. Uh, This next story, uh, after the break, has got a bit of a twist, I think, and I think you'll really uh, enjoy it. Um, Does take some history, uh, brings about some history, and uh, American history in particular, and I think that you'll really be able to enjoy that. And of course, I do have our uh, my 13 deadliest plants that will be coming up later in the show. The 13 deadliest plants, of course, it is a, a deadly number, but also these plants have certain aspects and characteristics about them that aren't so conducive uh, to um, eating or partaking them or maybe rubbing them on your flesh, whatever. Of course, we know there are uh, chemicals in plants like poison ivy, poison sumac, uh, poison oak that can irritate and bother the skin, and some of these plants have even more. 
uh, even more strong effects than the ones that we find around here. So definitely hang out for that. And um, before we go any further, I want to make sure that you know that we are on Facebook at WRWH, and we're also on YouTube. You can watch old shows on YouTube, WRWH. Just search that, and you can get all of the old shows. If you've missed anything this summer, and now that we're into the fall, you need some good information, you want to listen to things uh, that pertain to the garden, you can definitely check us out there. Hold on tight, folks, because we'll be right back with more spooky stories of the garden. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in Saturday mornings at 9 here on 93.9 FM WRWH. More great information coming your way on Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Welcome back to our special edition of Let's Get Growing. This is our Halloween edition, which means that we have been talking about plants that are a little spooky, plants that are scary. Even though these beautiful flowers and beautiful foliage that we see in the garden may attract us uh, in one way, it could hurt us in other ways. And we've already been talking about a few of those things already, and we've got plenty more to come. So be sure to hang around because uh, in a few moments you will hear my top 13 list uh, of the deadliest plants. Plants that uh, maybe you've never heard about, plants that maybe you have in your own garden and you never knew that they could be so dangerous. It's not that they're all deadly, by the way. It's just that some of them can be dangerous. And uh, I should probably go ahead and say that, you know, with children or um, pets in the garden, we do need to be a little careful and we need to be a little more cautious about our plants. I'm not trying to scare you away of gardening. Of course, I would never do that. But we have to realize that, you know, many of the medicines that we get in um, in, in modern medicine today have derivatives uh, that come from plants or have derived from plants, rather. Uh, acetyl salicylic acid, which is a fancy word for aspirin. Uh, aspirin came from a plant. And as a matter of fact, willow, uh, the bark of willow has been used uh, even in a Native American cultures as a um, anti-inflammation or anti-pain, I guess. I'm not a doctor. But uh, the, the bark could be brewed into a tea or chewed on and uh, can relieve some of of your pain symptoms. However, today I want to talk about not the good not the good looking plants, but the plants that you just are so tired of. Commonly we call them weeds. And of course, as the old saying goes, the definition of a weed is a, a plant that is in the wrong place. Um, and that is true to some degree. Even though a plant may be considered a weed to someone, it may not be a weed to someone else. So that's another thing that we need to keep in mind, that if the plant is in the wrong place, it's probably a weed, regardless of if it's a good plant or a bad plant. Now, with weeds in the garden, <clears throat> you want to be sure that you get them under control. You see, the weed seed bank is something that uh, exists in the soil. The weed seed bank is the number of weed seeds that are laying in waiting to germinate in your garden. Now, the goal of this uh, of, of this action is to get the weed seed bank as low as you possibly can. So, let's say you have thirty thousand weed seeds in your weed seed bank. What can you do to ensure that that thirty thousand drops lower and lower and lower? The number one thing that we can do is apply pre-emergence, and I know that we talked about this uh, several times on the program, but pre-emergence are basically uh, chemical controls. There are some organic controls like corn gluten, which can be applied to the surface of the soil. They create this barrier that does not allow weed seeds to, to completely germinate. They start to grow and then they just get zapped for whatever reason depending on which uh, product you're using. And of course, at the Lanier Nursery and Gardens, we have organic and chemical um, uh, pre-emergence, weed pre-emergence uh, available through the Bonide Company. Bonide produces some great quality products. They label it if it's uh, organic or not. And so you can easily discover what it is you want. So you can start off by doing pre-emergence. Now, you know, right now you've probably already starting to see some of the cool season or the winter weeds coming in. It's too late to apply pre-emergence because, again, pre-emergence only work if you have um, applied them before they emerge. That's why they're called pre-emergence. The next type of weed control would be post-emergent. Post-emergent means after the plant has emerged. Now, 
this is um, can be done in many ways. First of all, you can uh, use a hoe, a shovel. You can use your fingers by pulling, and you can use some physical action to get rid of a plant, a weed plant that's already started to grow. But you can also use chemical controls. Now, you've got to be careful on this note because some chemical controls or organic controls are just broad killers. They not only kill weeds, but they also kill plants in the garden that are beneficial. Your beautiful hydrangeas may get suffered if it's not the right kind of chemical. Generally, these uh, po- post-emergent controls are going to control either grass-like weeds or broadleaf weeds. So we've got to be really careful because, for instance, hydrangea is a broadleaf plant and it can be damaged by a chemical that controls broadleaf weeds. Now, if it's a grass killer, it's only going to attack grass. So your lawn could be damaged if you spray it in the wrong place. So we've got to be careful. We've got to know what we're applying and we want to do it safely. We want to do it uh, kindly to the earth, of course. Uh, the the earth is holy, right? Uh, there is uh, a sense of um, of giving that the earth gives to us. So we want to make sure that we're doing things appropriately in the garden and responsibly. So this is a little bit about helping you to get your weeds under control and to reduce the weed seed bank. But my next story on this special Halloween edition has to do with weeds, but not a weed that necessarily intrudes into the landscape, but a weed that can intrude into your life, and fatally taking you down. And I hope you enjoy this next little tale. Sometimes plants can have an effect on our lives without us even realizing what's going on. Sometimes the effect can be positive, such as the fragrance of a rose on a summer's day. But other times, the effect can turn, well, deadly. And such was the case for Nancy Hanks. Nancy Hanks was born in the last decade of the 18th century in a town that would later become known as Antioch, West Virginia. But in 1806, she fell in love and married a farmer carpenter named Thomas, Their love grew and produced three children, the eldest, a girl named Sarah, a boy named Abraham, and the youngest, Thomas Jr., who died the same year he was born, 1812. In 1816, the year that Indiana became the 19th state of the U.S., Thomas and Nancy took their young family and moved to the new state to homestead in a settlement known as Little Pigeon Creek. They built their cabin with their own hands. And it was in this little cabin that Nancy taught young Sarah and Abraham not only their letters, but also extraordinary sweetness and patience. For you see, Nancy has been described as being mild, tender, and intellectually inclined. Author William Herndon writes that Nancy was ordinary height and stature, weighed about 130 pounds, was slenderly built and had much the appearance of one inclined to consumption. Her skin was dark, hair dark brown, eyes gray and small, forehead prominent, face sharp and angular, with a marked expression for melancholy of all who ever saw or knew her. Though her life was clouded by a spirit of sadness, she was in disposition amiable and generally cheerful. Perhaps her sad-looking characteristics were just a foreshadow of the doom to come. It was just two years later, after moving to Little Pigeon Creek in 1818, that Nancy died. Even though the cause of her death has conflicting tales, the most popular explanation for her death is that she died of milk sickness. As a matter of fact, several people succumbed to the illness in Little Pigeon Creek that season including her aunt and uncle, Elizabeth and Thomas Sparrow, who young Nancy had lived with for several years while growing up. Milk sickness is what it was called, yet in 1818, the science behind the disease was not well known. You see, milk sickness is caused by drinking the milk or eating the meat of cows that have feasted off of a little western green weed known as white snake root a close relative of our eastern Joe Pieweed. Though milk sickness is rare today, it was common amongst migrants to the Midwest in the 19th century, and it claimed thousands of lives. 
Anna Pierce Hobbs Bixby, or also known as Dr. Anna on the frontier, is credited with identifying white snake root as the culprit. The plant is not normally grazed by cattle unless other sources of forage are not available. So when pasture was scarce, cows would graze in the woods, the natural habitat of white snake root. The cows are not affected by the plant quite like humans are, so it wasn't clear that the milk or meat of these animals was poisoned. Because of this, people were fearful of milk sickness, just as they were of infectious diseases like cholera and yellow fever, whose causes were not understood at the time either. Today, however, we know that milk sickness is caused due to a potent toxin called Timetrol that is found within the white snake root plant. Once ingested by the cow, it is passed through the animal's milk and meat, which sadly found its way to dear Nancy. Just like Nancy, others who suffered from milk sickness would have experienced trembling, vomiting, and severe intestinal pain until the sufferer finally succumbed to the toxin. On October 5, 1818, Nancy died at the age of 34. Her nine-year-old son, Abraham, helped his father build his mother's coffin, whittling away at wooden dowels to create pegs that would hold the planks together. Perhaps this was just another foreshadow, however, for it was the same Abraham that would use his words to hold the states of a divided nation together in years to come. This Abraham would be known as the 16th President of the United States of America, Abraham Lincoln, and it was white snake root that killed Abraham Lincoln's mother, Nancy Hanks Lincoln. However, if you think this is where the story ends, you would be wrong. You see, white snake root is still very much alive and grows wild, even probably in your backyard. Oh, that was a quite mysterious tale, don't you think? I hope it didn't scare you too much, but uh, who saw that end coming, right? Who knew that Abraham Lincoln's mother had died uh, by a plant? And that kind of brings me up to my next little topic to discuss is, you know, just because a plant doesn't have fur and teeth and claws and doesn't necessarily look dangerous doesn't mean it's always safe. So anytime you go into the woods, never just start eating plants. Uh, kind of, I guess it, maybe we should just kind of know that, I guess. But without knowing a plant, we can't just be foraging uh, and trying to figure out what works and what doesn't. We need to do a little research if we want to go that route. So we want to definitely be sure that with any kind of weed or whatnot, that we don't just throw it into our salad and chomp down on it because you never know. And you kind of have to know your plant um, before you start doing things with it. Uh, a lot of plants, who would have known um, that their family is notorious for poisonous toxins and whatnot, like the Eupatoria there, that um, Eupatoria, which is similar to the Joe Pye weed uh, that you heard in the tale. You see that the, the white snake root uh, has a toxin, which can be deadly, whereas some others, they're just fine. So we do have to know our plant. We do have to get an idea for what we're doing. But considering weeds, we definitely have to work that weed seed bank down. Again, I've already mentioned pre-emergence and post-emergence, and we have to keep that going. Another idea that you need to uh, consider and mark on your calendar is to never let a weed go to seed. You can say that with me. Never let a weed go to seed. And what I mean by that is as soon as you see some kind of weed blooming, you know that seeds are about to come. Seeds are about to come and you don't want those seeds to fall to the ground and increase the number of the weed seed in your weed seed bank. Again, the goal is to try and reduce the number of weeds seed in the weed seed bank. Oh, too many words here. We don't ever want a weed to go to seed. So if you've got to get out there and mow it down or something, do so. Don't allow that weed to go to seed because you will be fighting an endless battle of weeds for the rest of your life in the garden, for sure. Um, so weeds are an interesting story. But like I mentioned, in a few moments, we'll be right back and we will be talking about my top 13 deadliest plants. Again, 
Don't think that they're just going to come out and crawl into your uh, bedroom window and eat you. Not that kind of deadly, but they can be dangerous. They can be harmful in one way or another. And if you stick around, you'll be able to hear the 13 deadliest plants uh, that I would talk about this Halloween season. We'll be right back. For live editions of Let's Get Growing, tune in Saturday mornings at 9 on 93.9 FM WRWH. Back to more Let's Get Growing with Nathan Wilson. Well, here we are, folks, back for the last and final segment of our special Halloween Tales. Yes, folks, if you're just joining us, we have been uh, talking about plants that are a little uneasy, uh, plants that are a little dangerous, and some that are quite deadly. If you've missed any part of this program and you'd like to revisit it, be sure to go to WRWH's Facebook page and YouTube channel. Just go to YouTube.com and search WRWH, and you will find every episode of Let's Get Growing posted there for your listening and viewing pleasure because we do have a video aspect on Facebook Live. But as promised, folks, it is now time for me to list my uh, 13 deadliest plants. And I hope that uh, this list helps terrify your way back into the garden. Nature is terrifying. Spiders, earthquakes, bears, hurricanes, and sharks all provide ample fodder for our nightmares. But botanical life rarely gets its dues for being scary. Despite the fact that there are plants that kill, sting, poison, and just chill in the woods looking creepy, these plants will have you feeling a little less safe the next time you venture outdoors. The bleeding tooth fungus its not exactly a plant, But still, have you ever wondered what it would be like if the shower curtain from Psycho grew into the forest? Look no further than the bleeding tooth fungus. True to its name, the young fruit of this fungus bleeds a bright red fluid. Giant Hogweed Contact with the sap of giant hogweed can cause scars, nasty blisters, and even blindness. In 1971, the band Genesis released a song called Beware of the Giant Hogweed on their album Nursery Crime, which details the plant's invasion of Great Britain. Lyrics from the song go, Botanical creature stirs, seeking revenge. Royal beasts did not forget. Soon they escaped, spreading their seed, preparing for an onslaught threatening the human race. Red Tide Red tides, or algal blooms, as they're commonly called, are a phenomenon in which algae exist in such high concentrations that it discolors the water. Red tides are considered to be the inspiration behind the biblical blood ocean from the story of Exodus. Algal blooms occur all over the world, and the algae differs from body of water to body of water. The effects of red tide can be fatal to sea creatures and humans who consume seafood contaminated with the toxin. Although not all red tides are poisonous, their decomposing process can deplete the water of oxygen, forcing animals to either relocate or die. Death Camus It looks harmless enough, but as the name implies, Death Camus is toxic. All parts of death camas, the stem, the leaves, flowers, and its onion look-alike bulbs, contain the poisonous alkaloid zygodenine. Consuming the plant in amounts that equal as little as 2-6% to of an animal's body weight will most likely be fatal. If you're lucky enough to avoid death, you'll endure vomiting, drooling, decreased blood pressure, diarrhea, weakness, and possibly a seizure or a coma. Venus flytrap By far the most famous of creepy plants, the Venus flytrap is known as the predator of the plant world. Its trapping mechanism is made up of a mouth, two leaves, trigger hairs that sense prey, and tooth-like cilia that keep the prey from escaping. The Venus flytrap doesn't mess around either. It can tell the difference between live prey and non-prey like raindrops, and it allows small prey that wouldn't be worth the energy of digestion to go free. Cascuda, or daughter vine. The daughter vine is also known by the folk name strangleweed 
because it wraps itself around other plants and inserts itself into their vascular systems, basically starving its host plant for life. Other sinister nicknames include devil's guts, devil's hair, devil's ringlet, and witch's hair. The brain cactus. Varieties of Mammillaria elongata, native to Mexico, grow in many different shapes, most distinctive of which is the brain cactus. We are not aware of any specific benefits, says Amanda Betton, the horticulture manager of the Franklin Park Conservatory and Botanical Gardens in Ohio. Many cacti sport some unusual growth patterns. The brain cactus is singled out as more unusual as it looks so much like the human brain as it matures. Angel's Trumpet All parts of the angel trumpet are poisonous. Exposure can cause paralysis, migraines, hallucinations, and even death. Though people drink angel trumpet tea for its hallucinogenic properties, the effects of angel trumpet are unpleasant, and because a lot of different factors, including hydration and time of the season, can affect the concentration of the toxic alkaloid, it's almost impossible to determine a safe amount to consume. However, people still grow the plant for its medical benefits, including anesthetic and anti-asthmatic properties. When it comes to plants like angel trumpets, pets should be kept away from these plants, and you should wash your hands after handling cut stems. Jimpai Jimpai Tree Jimpai Jimpai has a reputation as the most painful tree ever. Its stinging hairs deliver a potent neurotoxin, and severe sting from the tree can even be fatal to humans. All you have to do is lightly touch the plant to feel the effects of the toxins, which can include a burning sensation, aching joints, and swelling under the armpits. If you are stung by the gimpai gimpai tree, be sure to remove the hairs, or else they will keep releasing the poison. Doll's Eye Doll's eye, or Actea, is a plant that's native to Northeast America. Its name comes from its berries, which resemble eyeballs. The highly poisonous fruit ripens in the summer and stays until frost, so the timing is just perfect for Halloween. The corpse flower. Amorpha phallus titanum is part of a group of flowers classified as a carrion flower, or corpse flower, because they actually smell like rotting flesh in order to attract pollinators like beetles and flies. The plant, which can be up to 10 feet tall, is sometimes called the world's largest flower, but it's actually made up of thousands of small flowers. Bladder wart. The underwater leaves of the bladder wart form a bladder that traps small aquatic creatures. The bladder, which works similar to a vacuum, is an incredibly sophisticated trapping mechanism. Unlike most carnivorous plants, it can survive almost anywhere typically in wet soil, but sometimes floating in the water. And lastly, dragon's blood tree. Dracaena cinnabari, the dragon's blood tree, gets its folk name from its crimson sap that resembles blood. The sap, or resin, has been used for its anti-inflammatory properties, gastrointestinal benefits, and as dye or lipstick. The sap is also believed to have mystical properties and is used to enhance spells in ritual magic. And there you have it, folks, my 13 deadliest plants that you would find in and out of the garden. Again, folks, we have talked about a lot of plants and kind of brought to the surface um, aspects of plants, characteristics of plants um, that can be dangerous. So a uh, final word, a uh, note here on these types of plants is know your plant before you start touching or eating, especially. Uh, you got to make sure that you're safe in the garden and that your children and pets are safe. They're the ones that tend to get a little mischievous, uh, especially with things that they don't know. So be sure to protect them. Folks, feel free to join us every week right here on WRWH at nine o'clock on Saturdays for uh, gardening questions and answers, tips, ideas, and inspirations. And as I always say, now it's time to get growing. And let's get growing together. Thanks for joining us for today's Let's Get Growing program with Nathan Wilson. If you have a comment about today's program, you can reach out to Nathan by sending an email to grow at lanier nursery gardens.com.
Join us next Saturday for Let's Get Growing on Local News Radio 93.9 FM and AM 1350.